Uh, big, big thanks to Jim for the invite, and of course for Emily for coordinating my schedule. Uh, had a had a terrific visit. Every minute of it, I've enjoyed thoroughly. So, thanks for everybody who took the time to meet with me today, and a big thanks and kudos to Emily for kind of coordinating my schedule. As she mentioned, I'm from here, so I actually spent a lot of my life hanging out around Ames and, um, you know, kind of exploring the the natural history of this country so full of game. And so to be here today right now is uh, is really special to me. Uh, so thank you all again. I'm honored to be here to, to share with you, you know, a little story about a, a day in the life of this little brown bird. So um, the question of just how much to invest in replicating one's genetic material is, of course, a, a foundational question in evolutionary and behavioral ecology and one that's exemplified by tremendous diversity, folks. Uh, within and among taxa, and work over about the past half century or so to attempt to explain uh, these patterns of variation have given us a pretty robust framework for kind of uh, explaining patterns of parental care and kind of a cost-benefit uh, approach. And what we're left with is this notion that optimal levels of parental care are kind of balanced between the benefits of offspring survival and parental inclusive fitness, but those are weighed against the cost of providing care to a parent's ability to invest in other offspring. So within any given reproductive event, parents, of course, have a limited amount of resources with which to allocate to those offspring, and so they need to be strategic about how they do so. We know that parents in many avian taxa, of course, are not completely egalitarian in how they distribute resources among their young. Uh, many offspring often vary tremendously in things like age, size, sex, or competitive ability, or any number of traits that might reflect their value in an evolutionary sense to their parents. And so parents are thought to, uh, or should be selected to allocate resources optimally among those young uh, and bias investment toward the offspring that are most likely to provide a return on that investment. And today, I'm going to talk about a component of that known as sex allocation. And as I'll talk about it today, we tend to see it in two main forms, the most common of which being overall adjustments to the overall sex ratio of offspring, either overproducing sons or overproducing daughters, or more kind of fine-tuned adjustments to the sex of individual offspring, perhaps within their broods. And in birds, females are the heterogametic sex. So that means the egg that the female lays, whether it received the, the chromosome that confers maleness or the chromosome that confers femaleness to those, that offspring, that's what will determine its sex. So females are thought to have some ability, potentially, to influence the sex of their young. Some of the early work on this, just, just for a little bit of background, some early work on this is generally attributed to Sir Ronald Fisher, who set out to explain why most populations of organisms tend to have equal representation of males and females at the population level, and he used negative frequency dependence to explain this. And, and what he did was kind of conduct a bit of a thought experiment. He just laid out a scenario. Let's say uh, we had a male bias at the population level that means parents that overproduced daughters would stand to reap substantial fitness benefits, right? Because they would be the rarer sex. That's the negative frequency dependence. The rare phenotype would confer the highest fitness. So uh, what he predicted was that if there was ever a perturbation from equilibrium, subsequent generations of offspring would potentially see an overrepresentation of that rare sex. And indeed, subsequent work in a number of species, including flies and fishes and even some wild birds, suggest that parents actually produce the rare sex in response to the population level sex ratio. And what's interesting about this is that Fisher pointed out that, you know, at equilibrium, equal investment will ultimately be uh, uh, the adaptive scenario. But what uh, an interesting note about kind of some of the subsequent empirical work is that parents aren't necessarily selected or constrained to produce one-to-one -one sex ratios, but they were responding to uh, current context and, and producing the rare sex in, in certain contexts. So that was true kind of at the population level. It still is true. But at the level of the individual, uh, what's important to keep in mind is that reproductive success for males in a large majority of animal taxa is often more variable than it is for females along this vertical axis here. And it's also more strongly dependent upon body condition for males than it is for females as they uh, have to compete with other males for access to females. Most females are going to be able to find a mate and reproduce regardless of their body condition, but males in really good condition can outcompete smaller, wimpier males. They're really sexy. They can mate with many females, uh, whereas those on the other end of the spectrum, of course, 
uh, will struggle to find a mate and reproduce. And when that occurs, then the maternal ability to produce high quality offspring or maternal investment ability should tend to correspond to the sex ratio that that mother produces. When able to produce high quality offspring, mothers should overproduce sons because males reared in a high quality environment will have higher fitness than their sisters. On the other end of the spectrum, when unable to invest heavily in the offspring, mothers should overproduce daughters because even poor quality daughters or daughters reared in poor environmental conditions will have higher fitness than sons reared in a similar environment. Uh, so this is a hypothesis. It's, it's been around for a while. He published it in Science, made a big splash, and, and this has been around for quite a while, but there are some important assumptions underlying this hypothesis that ought to be met if selection is actually going to favor this kind of behavior. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of these assumptions have gone largely untested for a long time. Uh, so the notion that parental care is positively associated with uh, offspring condition and probability of future reproduction, hopefully that's not too big of a stretch of the imagination, but surprisingly actually somewhat understudied in, in wild systems. Uh, the notion that offspring condition predicts adult condition, and critically, this notion that there are sex-specific effects of natal environmental conditions on offspring reproductive success as adults, or an interaction between offspring sex, the rearing environment, and their effect on offspring reproductive value. And these are some of the things that I'd like to talk about today. Oops. Uh, we test these ideas and others at uh, a couple of field sites out in central Illinois. So we've got about 820 nest boxes in a forested study area about half an hour from Illinois State University. Boxes are all kind of uh, uniform in dimensions and size, uh, protected to an extent by predation by these aluminum uh, predator baffles. And each of these dots here represents a box. And I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a little sliding trap door right there, the entrance to the box. And we can hook a fishing line up to that. So bird flies into the box, we pull on the fishing line, door slides closed, and then you've got the bird in the box. So we can catch, uh, capture them in the boxes or using mist nets. Um, and uh, with 820 nest boxes, we get somewhere around five to 600 nests per year. Okay, and so it's a very tract tractable system amenable to a number of observational or, or experimental studies. And it's nice in the sense that it happens over a relatively short period of time. These birds are almost adult size uh, after about maybe 10 days in the nest. They fledge a little over two weeks. Uh, and so we can collect a, a lot of data in a short period of time. So uh, it's just really been a, an absolute gold mine in terms of the, the kinds of studies we're able to conduct. But just moving forward, just to reiterate a couple of important questions uh, for us to keep in mind. Does offspring sex interact with the rearing environment so as to promote sex ratio adjustment? And if that's the case, do sex ratio uh, uh, patterns actually vary according to predictions of this uh, turbis will and model? Uh, so the early rearing environment has long been known to have pretty important consequences for offspring development, life history trajectories, and fitness. And an example occurs in birds when females vary in the onset of incubation of their eggs. So asynchronous hatching of eggs is very common among avian taxon and occurs when females begin incubating before they've actually laid all of their eggs. So embryonic development is staggered, and some of these earlier offspring begin development even before their younger siblings have been produced. Okay? And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, this is, this is a bit of a continuum, but for our purposes it's, it's simplest just to kind of call it synchronous versus asynchronous hatching. Females often really significantly delay the onset of full incubation, and so embryonic development occurs at the same time. Those babies tend to hatch within a day of each other and are similar in size shortly after hatching. Here's an asynchronously hatched nestling that's at over twice the size of two of its younger siblings. So this has pretty important consequences for the sibling competitive environment that occurs within these nests right after hatching. And these differences are not merely transient, but they persist to affect things like body mass, skeletal body size, prior to independence from parental care. So this is prior to fledging. Again, synchronously hatched nestlings, all the same age, size, competitive ability, so nobody really differs from anybody with respect to hatching order within those broods. Okay? Obviously a big effect of, of age going on here within the asynchronous broods. But what's interesting to me about this is that these earlier hatched asynchronous nestlings are the same age as these synchronously hatched nestlings. So clearly had benefited substantially from their competitive advantage over their younger siblings. Okay? And we know uh, that, that body mass, body condition, size-adjusted body mass at this age is positively predictive of 
recruitment, so whether or not these offspring actually uh, reproduce in the population as adults. And so what we had initially predicted in the context of this Trivers Willard model is that these early hatched eggs should more likely contain boys than girls, and their younger siblings should more likely be female than male, whereas within the synchronously hatched broods, nobody has a competitive advantage, so we expected no sex ratio bias across the laying sequence. And this is more or less what we found within these synchronous nests. None of these means are statistically any different from each other. None of them are actually different from a one-to-one -one sex ratio. But first laid eggs within asynchronous broods are more likely to produce sons than daughters and more likely to produce sons than later laid eggs, which are also more likely to produce uh, daughters statistically than they are sons. <laughs> Purely an observational study, of course. Uh, so no manipulation going on. And so what I wanted to do to follow that up was kind of manipulate egg production by females. And birds are kind of interesting in the sense that some birds actually will uh, produce replacement eggs if they turn up missing from the nest during egg, uh, egg production. So if you go to a nest during egg laying and you pull away an egg, the female will replace that egg. And you can use that uh, kind of a manipulation to get females to lay significantly larger clutches than they normally otherwise would. So here we've got females to lay 10 egg clutches. The idea obviously was that that increase in clutch size should lead to a reduction in allocation among those supernumerary offspring, among the eggs produced beyond the normal amount. And when we looked within those eggs, uh, we indeed saw an increase in the production of daughters among later laid eggs. So relative laying order of one, it's the last laid egg. Uh, we saw a decline in the production of sons among those uh, experimental eggs. And also when we looked among nests, we saw something uh, indicative of a, a, a sex allocation among nests as well. So the female ability to actually produce these extra large eggs is actually strongly resource dependent. So a lot of good experimental work indicates that uh, female ability to do this is, is uh, reflective of her resource availability. And this is generally true. A lot of uh, uh, you know, supplemental feeding experiments can get birds to lay significantly more eggs and things like that. So again, a, a positive relationship between the proportion of sons within eggs and a, I think a pretty objective measure of maternal investment. Something that came out of this that initially was somewhat surprising but now uh, has really kind of captivate, captivated me over the years was this sex by environment interaction. This is without respect to synchrony or asynchrony and hatching uh, you can see that males and females seem to be affected differently by the conditions in which they are reared. And so what I wanted to do was follow this up with a couple of experiments. One, the competitive hierarchy experiment. Here, I just swapped babies among nests. So I took a uh, one-day-old nestling and I put it in a four-day-old brood and a, a four-day-old nestling and I put it in a one-day-old brood to create kind of uh, a competitive advantage or a competitive disadvantage for these individuals while holding brood size constant before and after the, the swap. And then in another experiment, the brood size experiment, I created broods of eight nestlings and broods of four nestlings. That's an increase and a uh, decrease of two uh, relative to the modal brood size. And so the idea here was to hold nestling age constant but to manipulate uh, per capita food availability for these babies. And within the competitive hierarchy experiment, we saw pretty quickly these birds diverged in their uh, growth trajectories. Okay, so, so these guys benefited pretty substantially from their competitive advantage. These guys were in a real hurt locker. Okay, so they, uh, they were pretty competitively disadvantaged. Okay, but it had a sex-specific effect as well. So those competitively advantaged older nestlings, if they were male, they did even better than they would have if they were female. But when placed at a competitive disadvantage, the males did pretty bad. Similar results in the brood size experiment. So we actually uh, documented provisioning rates by parents to these nests, and we noticed that, that these broods indeed had significantly higher per nestling food availability. Okay? And males, regardless of the mechanism, I don't know what the mechanism here was, but seemed to be doing better than females reared in a similar environment and uh, tended to do poorer than females when reared in a more intense competitive environment. Okay, so I've just manipulated you know, aspects of the rearing environment, the competitive environment in which these nestlings were reared. What would be neat is if we could kind of compare uh, or kind of induce changes in parental behavior, parental care for their offspring, and see these effects when offspring are all gen on a generally level playing field. 
And I'm not going to go uh, uh, too much into this, but this kind of comes from this idea of uh, what we call the terminal investment hypothesis. And that, that's just this idea that if a bird detects that its probability of survival and future reproduction is in decline, it should essentially push in all of its chips. It should invest heavily into current reproduction because uh, that current brood of offspring is likely to be that parent's last. Okay? And so we did this by inducing an immune response in breeding females. This is with uh, lipopolysaccharides. So we just induced an immune response, but didn't necessarily create effects on female behavior that were caused by a pathogen. And we saw that those females actually responded by, by really increasing their uh, delivery of arthropod prey to their nestlings. And within those, uh, that, that treatment group, experimental sons did significantly better than, than their sisters in terms of their growth prior to independence from parental care. So those are some, you know, kind of sex by environment interactions while offspring are still in the nest, but, you know, we still haven't addressed whether these effects maybe persist and affect adult reproduction, okay? And hopefully, again, I don't have to do too much convincing to, to, to get you to believe that there are generally positive effects of parental care for offspring, right? Generally providing care for one's offspring is thought to improve the fitness of those offspring. And so a couple of experiments that, uh, that we've done, independent studies showing, you know, food availability, positively predicting uh, the, the pre-fledging condition of nestlings. We know that the recruitment of offspring, so whether or not they survive and reproduce within the population as adults, is strongly dependent upon their body mass prior to independence. And not surprisingly then, uh, food availability per nestling per hour so the effort put forth by mom and dad tends to correlate as well with, with increased recruitment of offspring. And also with those cross-fostering experiments, I just described the, the brood size experiment and the competitive hierarchy experiment. Those from kind of more putatively good conditions, the competitively advantaged nestlings, those in the smaller broods, had significantly higher uh, recruitment than those reared in, in more intense competitive environments. So, okay, I think we can safely assume that parental care is positively associated with offspring condition and probability of future reproduction. That's not too, uh, too big of a leap of faith. So does offspring condition predict adult condition? Uh, here it does. You can see that uh, uh, females appear to have a higher uh, intercept than males do in this case. We catch the vast majority of our females during incubation, and their gonads are still enlarged at that time. After those eggs hatch, the female, uh, their gonads regress and they, they lose some body mass and are basically identical in, in uh, mass uh, to the males. So uh, don't confuse this as being kind of a reverse sexual size dimorphism. They're basically sexually monomorphic as both nestlings and more or less as adults. But uh, offspring body condition significantly predicts adult body condition. And we saw sex-specific effects on their reproductive success. So for girls, uh, prior to independence from parental care, no effect of body condition at that time on their reproductive success as adults. But for males, uh, uh, there was a positive effect. Now, house wrens are uh, polygynous species, so males that can uh, secure and defend multiple nesting sites can actually mate with multiple females at the same time. And we know from a number of experimental studies that, that, fem that males that are able to do that, to, to monopolize multiple nesting sites, are really sexy females like those males a lot better. They obviously have higher reproductive success. And a lot of this has to do with, with their body condition and intrasexual competitive ability. So there are actually reports of house wren males actually killing other males over access to these breeding sites. So, so it's a limiting resource critical for reproduction and the ability to secure this uh, is pretty important uh, uh, and determined by body mass for males. So those assumptions are generally met in this uh, particular species. So the question is, do brood sex ratios actually vary according to what we might predict? And uh, to assess this, I just used kind of a, uh, I think, an objective proxy for maternal investment ability, and that's the maternal ability to produce multiple broods per summer. So females will sometimes produce two broods of offspring in a single summer. About 50 to maybe 70% of them will do that. And the remaining, you know, maybe 30 to 50% of females produce only one brood per summer, even though they've got the time to do so. They're, they're, they're not doing it. And this is strongly dependent upon their body condition earlier within breeding seasons. So, again, I think a, a pretty objective kind of delineation between those investing a lot and those investing a little. And we tend to find that those producing multiple broods of offspring 
per summer overproduce boys and those uh, relative to females just producing a single brood per breeding season. Uh, this is a, a pretty robust data set, multiple years, uh, not a huge difference, but, it, but it's a pretty robust uh, data set. In fact, it's been replicated in another population. So there's a group at the uh, University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee that also study house wrens, and they've shown this exact same pattern. That females that produce multiple broods per summer overproduce sons relative to those just producing one. So uh, again, it's a statistically significant difference. You can tell these differences are not big, right? This effect size is not particularly large. Um, maybe not as big as we might have expected. And this actually uh, goes back uh, to a kind of a hypothesis of the great George C. Williams, who proposed that in the context of this Trivers and Willard model, if females are actually doing this, if females actually overproduce sons in certain contexts and daughters in other contexts, then we should detect this at the level of the population by comparing uh, the frequency distribution, the actual variation in the brood sex ratios, where if females are, are biasing, you know, broods towards sons or daughters more often than predicted by chance, sex ratio distribution should be kind of platycurtotic. They should be flatter and wider than the null hypothesis, right? If, if sex is just determined by a coin flip, then sex ratios should, should be kind of normally distributed at the population level effectively. Uh, but we don't see this, okay? So, so if anything, interestingly enough, we, we see evidence that females are biasing sex ratios non-randomly, statistically significantly, okay? But if anything, uh, observed sex ratios of one-to-one -one are actually more common than as predicted in this hypothesis of, of, of Williams, okay? So this actually goes back uh, quite a ways. So there are a number of, a, a whole pile of studies that have actually used this comparison, compare observed and expected sex ratios and use that comparison as a determinant of whether or not females are, are adjusting offspring sex ratios. And in each of these three studies, for example, on that comparison and that comparison alone, concluded that females couldn't do this. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and, I mean, it's just, it's just interesting to me. I mean, this is a kind of a, a long-standing problem, right, going back uh, for quite a few decades. And, and I like this middle paper here. It's a, it's a beautiful paper, really wonderfully written. And I like the, what they call it, a theoretical enigma, okay? So, so selection might favor the female ability to adjust offspring sex, but we don't detect evidence of it on the basis of that test. And so there's, this is somewhat enigmatic, if you will. And so uh, summarizing George C. Williams' paper, if I may, he says, sex ratios of wild vertebrates show the binomial distributions to be expected if each sex determination is an independent event sex seems to be just another Mendelian unit character, okay? So females can't adjust offspring sex. They're constrained to Mendelian segregation of sex chromosomes during meiosis. So sex ratios are just going to be a coin flip. This obviously contrasts with, with some data that suggests that females can do this, okay? This is from a meta-analysis in science that suggests that chromosomal sex determination does not necessarily prevent facultative sex ratio adjustment, but rather the parental ability to predict their offspring's environment is what influences sex ratio patterns across taxa. So obviously pretty different viewpoints here, right? And so how do we kind of reconcile these things given the, the data that we have? And, and this is a long-standing problem, but I actually think that um, in the context of sex-specific environmental sensitivity, we might be able to explain why these effect sizes on sex ratios aren't very big, why sex ratio variation tends not to be very high relative to the null expectation. So traditionally, we might expect high-quality mothers to overproduce sons. This is a very a generalizable uh, uh, thing. There are obviously exceptions to this. And we might expect you know, poor-quality mothers to overproduce daughters. Um, and so we might tend to think that the fitness of offspring should, should kind of look like this in res with respect to maternal ability and the brute sex ratio. But if sons are more sensitive to env environmental conditions, and particularly sibling rivalry, then overproducing sons, the more sensitive sex, might actually reduce brood level productivity with the net result that we get effectively stabilizing selection on an equal sex ratio that doesn't necessarily involve uh, Mendelian segregation or negative frequency dependent selection or anything like that. And this actually goes back uh, quite a long way. So um, it, it's funny. So Darwin is sometimes thought to have described uh, Fisher's principle, the notion of, 
frequency dependent selection favoring equal investment in sons and daughters. Um, I was getting kind of conflicting reads on this in, in certain parts of the literature, and so I finally went back and I looked at this myself. This is the first edition of the Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, and I wanted to read a couple of slides, just a couple of, just so bear with me. This is the, it just puts me in my happy place, okay? So especially the students, if you have an opportunity to read Darwin, just just do it, okay? I know nobody does, but but uh, just go ahead and do it. It's just, it, this, is, this was really special to me. So Darwin says, an excess of either sex, we will say of the males, could, however, apparently uh, be eliminated through natural selection in another and indirect manner, namely by an actual diminution of the males. For whenever the limit to the numbers which exist depend not on destruction by enemies, but on the amount of food, increased fertility will lead to severe competition and to most of the survivors being badly fed. And hence the offspring of the parents which had wasted the least force in producing superfluous males would be the most likely to survive. And thus we may conclude that natural selection will always tend, though sometimes inefficiently, to equalize the relative numbers of the two sexes. So, to summarize, increased fertility, increased maternal investment, producing more babies, resulting in offspring being poorly fed, and an increase in the production of superfluous males. Unfortunately, Darwin didn't really feel like he nailed this when he published that in 1871. So all of the text that I just showed you was removed from the second edition and replaced, replaced with this. So, but that's okay. I mean, it's, you know, he did the best he could, and Darwin himself was a human after all. And so, so he did what he thought was, was best at the time, and he removed all of that text and left us with this. So it's over 140 years ago now, and we've still got this theoretical enigma, right? But I think that knowing what we know about sibling rivalry, at least in some species of birds, might kind of shed light on whether mothers should be selected to produce really extreme sex ratios, or heavily male biased sex ratios, of course. Uh, because, of course, producing a you know 100% males within a brood is necessarily going to place some of those males later within the clutch in a pretty severe disadvantage when competing with their older siblings for food. And so we might expect that, that again, one-to-one -one sex ratios might have highest productivity overall. And we see this. This is, um, this is a number of years of data, hundreds of broods, both uh, you know, unmanipulated and uh, uh, cross-fostered uh, babies. The data uh, uh, look like this. So, so broods of equal sex ratios have essentially a 25% chance of producing a breeding adult within the population. That's pretty good. So it, I, was, I just love these data. Okay, so actually friends of mine have actually told me for years, oh, there's no way that sex ratios in birds is going to be this important determinant of fitness. And I just, I, I don't think so. I think that this is, uh, th this is important and it's an important selective agent on offspring sex ratios. So hopefully um, I've been able to convince you that uh, uh, the natal environment interacts with offspring sex. I like to call it robust daughters and sensitive sons. We've seen it in an observational context. A number of experimental manipulations where sons and daughters seem to respond differently in terms of their growth and probability of future reproduction to uh, varying environmental conditions. And offspring condition predicts adult condition and affects uh, reproductive success sex specifically. I haven't shown you these data yet. These are brand new data. So this is synchronous hatching, and this is asynchronous hatching. And the males from those asynchronous broods uh, just got these data this summer, um, appear to be better at mating with multiple females. So these guys are more likely to produce multiple broods of offspring simultaneously and sequentially than males that were reared within synchronously hatched broods and not without any kind of competitive advantage uh, growing up. And as a consequence, we see evidence of sex ratio adjustment, but only to an extent, right? So we see statistically significant effects on brood sex ratios, sex allocation within broods, but only to an extent. And not necessarily because of Mendelian segregation or because of physiological constraints, but potentially just because the fitness of parents is maximized when sons and daughters are produced in equal frequency. So, oops. so with that, I'd actually just like to close with this uh, quotation from, again, George C. Williams. And um, 
I, I think there's obviously a lesson to be learned here, right, about how we do science, especially for, for my young colleagues, and that is uh, don't give up on a good idea just because someone else, you know, no matter how famous or influential, said, oh, that's already been done, or that's not going to work. This, Williams wrote this in 1966, just a couple of years before these two guys, Bill Hamilton and Bob Trivers, published a couple of papers in science that effectively changed this field forever. So don't give up on a good idea. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank a number of people. My debts are substantial, including my lab mates, generous property owners who allow us to work on their property, and uh, various uh, generous funding organizations that have provided funding. And of course, thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. During your cross-fostering experiments, were there any uh, evidence that your parallel package of your own offspring as opposed to the ones that were? That's a good question. So can parents kind of discern discern their own kin and you know, we don't find any evidence of that so um, that that's that's an interesting question and and there's some work in in birds that maybe suggest that there can be some kind of olfactory kin recognition going on that 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 may be possible but um, but I don't think it's necessarily derived uh, kind of inducing any changes in parental care parental provisioning so, We've done a ton of uh, cross-fostering experiments over the summer, both whole broods and, and partial broods. Cross-fostering has no effect on, on the babies and, and the amount of food that they get. So that's a good question. Thanks for a great talk. What are you comparison of the female one for summer versus yep. the one that you do for summer? Mm -hmm. Do you find a slight difference in the number of males for the two versus the one? Yeah. Do you find a difference between the first clutch and the second clutch of the ones that do two clutches in the summer? So that, that's, a, that's a good question. So, so in that particular analysis that I showed you, that was all of the broods, including both broods produced by an individual female. Of course, we controlled for that non-independence and things like that. But when we look um, at just the first brood produced during the summer, for the, that difference actually, the p-value gets lower, that difference actually gets a little bit bigger. But um, for the females that produce multiple broods during a single summer, they don't necessarily seem to be uh, declining substantially or anything like that. It stays, for the most part, relatively similar. Are there are those birds, those females' conditions better over the course of the summer than single brooders? Can you look at that, or you yeah, just have that we can do that. And so, this, I mean, yeah. So that's um, that's actually that's a good question. So this has been looked at for a while, like kind of seasonal variation and prey availability and things like that. Um, and actually, that makes my answer a little bit more complex because normally what we see is a significant, significant reduction in prey availability, primarily lepidopteran larvae and things like that. And accompanied by that are, is a reduction in clutch size, a re, uh, you know, a reduction in clutch size, a reduction in nestling size. So nestlings are, are a lot smaller later on in the summer than they are earlier. And we, all, we do overall at the level of the population do see also a statistically significant decline in the pr production of suns over the course of the breeding season. So that kind of matches up with that. We don't necessarily know definitively that that's resource driven, but we do see on a, a generally changes in the brood sex ratio over the course of the breeding season. I really wish you hadn't asked me about that. <laughs> no, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. And um, so, so I don't, I mean, that's not my area of, of, of what I do. And um, the literature on that is mixed. Uh, there's actually, it, it's, it's interesting. It, it's really neat to take a look at this. And so, um, of course, sex is determined at the first meiotic division based on whether the Z chromosome or the, the W chromosome goes on to what's going to form the egg. And one of the candidates that was thought to maybe be involved in this is maternal hormones that might influence uh, the way those uh, chromosomes segregate. And one of them I think that is actually pretty, really kind of uh, 
compelling is, is the hormone corticosterone. It's associated with resource availability. And um, there's, there's been some pretty exciting work on this, actually, where uh, people will manipulate resource availability, get effects on court and corresponding effects on offspring sex ratios. People can manipulate male attractiveness. So in PFAL, so people have, have uh, kind of blacked off the eye spots on the, on the peacock's feathers and things like that, and, and you can manipulate maternal court there. And then those, and that, and that can induce changes in the offspring sex ratio as well. So there's some okay evidence. Obviously, I've just you know plucked those examples because there are plenty where they did a similar experiment and, and didn't see that kind of thing, or or maybe the sex ratio went in another direction. And so um, for a while, I, I think that this sounded really exciting. You know, the, the hormone mediated sex ratio adjustment. Um, we're not we're a ways away from that, but. Um, there's some evidence of it. It is mixed, um, but that, but suggests that you know it is possible. Could be that those you know the mixed results are caused by you know a number of selective forces acting on the sex ratio, and so so something like one hormone that affects this, it's probably not that simple. And thank you. Yeah, Fred. Yeah, this is a neat story. A lot of study together to tell my story. But there were some things that I wasn't sure about in. in you use sex allocation at times, sex ratio at times, mm -hmm. and those are often not the terms. term. Yeah. And then sex ratio and sure at times, whether you're referring to the primary sex ratio, like you just Sure, off, sure. Or were you referring to secondary? Secondary, good point, good point. So, so what I'm trying to understand is, is um, when you're talking about brood sex ratio, mm -hmm. is, is that because there's no mortality from the time they are laid to yep. the time they're fledging. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. So, and I, 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 you know, wasn't sure if I wanted to get into like primary sex ratio and secondary sex ratio and things like that. But, but, um, so mortality obviously occurs in a lot of these nests prior to, to our ability to sex a lot of these offspring. Um, let me just go back a second though. So. Um, these are uh, primary sex ratios. These are eggs that were collected and incubated in a lab, um, as, as was kind of the, the actual clutch sex ratio there as well. So we collected those eggs, brought them back in the lab, so no, no mortality had occurred at least uh, you know, prior to our sampling in that, in that context. Um, some mortality occurs in these cases, but if we, um, if we want to get really kind of conservative in how we analyze this, something that, that um, we'll sometimes do is... Uh, basically analyze a modified form of our data set. So, so in other words, uh, the sex ratios of these babies, if it's, you know, you get the result that you get, if you analyze modified forms of our data set, assuming that everybody that died was male or everybody that died was a female, these patterns all hold up just the same. So thanks for that question. Okay, great, yeah. yeah. Hello, my name is Jeff Hart. Thanks a lot, guys.